now I'd like to introduce Dr. Sam Berendis, who's been our moderator for this symposium for the last 10 years. And he's uh, from UCSF, heads up the Center for Neurobiology and Psychiatry. Sam, take it away. Right. I, I too would like to welcome Susan. And actually, we, we work really, really hard to persuade Susan to stay at UCSF, and we're really delighted that she could come to that. She was, everybody wanted her, but you know, we got her, so I thank you to the Stagnus for helping us do that. So, it's my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Danny Weinberg, who is director of the Genes, Cognition, and Psychosis program at the uh, National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, Danny has spent his entire scientific career at the NIMH, where he, and it's been an extraordinary scientific career, I and mean, he has uh, been interested in uh, the pathogenesis, the causes, the brain changes that happen in, um, in mental disorders, severe mental disorders, especially schizophrenia. And he has been remarkable in um, uh, moving with the general developments in biological science and applying libido imaging or genetics or whatever to this enormously important clinical problem. Uh, for this work, Danny has uh, received uh, a great many honors. Um, he has gotten the uh, Adolf Meyer Prize of the American Psychiatric Association, uh, the Lieber Prize from NARSAD, the NIH Director's Award. He's a past president of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, and he's a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, Danny is no stranger to the music festival. He serves as chair of the scientific advisory committee for the music festival, which helps to make decisions about how to use the funds that are raised here to, um, uh, to best advantage. And he also is chair of the um, committee that selected Dr. Anton uh, as the Staglin uh, Schizophrenia Research Awardee. And he, Danny will introduce Dr. Anton later. So, uh, I, I'm really very happy to introduce Danny to give this talk because he always gives a great talk and it's always a lot of fun. So, it's my great pleasure. Please welcome Danny Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good, good afternoon everybody. I'm wearing these sunglasses because you obviously realize I am the opening act for, the, for uh, Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys. I, I've given many talks in many different locations, but this is a first to be the opening act for this. I will take the glasses off now so I can see what I'm doing, but I wanted to make sure you appreciated my role here today. <laughs> Sam for the very nice introduction. I want to thank the Staglin family for honoring me as being part of their advisory board, but most importantly, to be part of this music festival, which is an extraordinary event. This is, from my perspective, this rivals any event that the American Cancer Society could claim. This is, has become perhaps the premier uh, uh, event of its kind uh, to raise the consciousness, not just the funding base, but the consciousness about the need for research in serious mental illness. So it, it's a really a testimony to their dedication and accomplishment that, that we're all here today. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a lesson in what the connection is between genes and mental illness. You, 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 you know, you can pick up any newspaper on any given day, watch television, and somebody's going to tell you that genes matter for all kinds of medical disorders. And we become increasingly aware of the fact that they matter for mental illness too, and they matter in a big way for mental illness. And I'm going to try to give you some examples of this and some understanding of how we've come to see this. You don't need to be a geneticist, you don't need to be a psychiatrist to know that there's something about how people act that seems to be inborn in them. And any parent or sibling knows that even from very early in life, we come with subtle differences. And the, these differences are to a significant degree inborn and related to what we inherit from our parents, which is our genes. There have been studies of identical twins, comparing them to uh, fraternal twins, which have shown that many human behavioral characteristics, not just psychiatric disorders, but aspects of personality and cognitive abilities, are for the most part determined 
by differences that people have in their genes. We've also known from many animal experiments that you can look for alterations in the genes of animals and they will have remarkable effects on the behavior of these animals. These effects don't just include whether the animal is aggressive or not, or smart or not, but can even verge on very complex social characteristics. Let me, let me note an example of this. This was an amazing study that appeared in the Journal of the American Academy of Sciences, the journal Science, a few years ago. And what's wrong with this picture? I don't, I don't know if my pointer works, but what's wrong with this picture is this is an ant colony, and there's something very wrong with this ant colony. What's wrong with the ant colony is that there's a second queen down in the lower right-hand corner of this ant colony. Ants have one queen in their colony because it really doesn't work well for the, for the industry of an ant colony to have multiple queens competing for the workers' attention. And this is, you know, ants probably are a lot like other societies, but at least for an ant colony, one queen is all that works. But this is an ant colony with more than one queen. And what was discovered in this genetic study was that the reason ant colonies only have one queen is not because there's only one queen born from all those larvae that are you know, filling up the corners of the ant colony. The reason there's one queen is that as soon as the first queen is born, it gives out a scent, a pheromone, which, chain, which is received by all the worker ants because they have pheromone receptors in their little tiny brains. And that pheromone changes the brains of those ants so that the next queen that is born, which is happening constantly, is destroyed. What these investigators discovered was a mutation, a genetic variation in the receptor for that pheromone in this colony that resulted in the ants no longer recognizing that there was a, another queen to be killed. And what was significant about the study was not just that the colony had multiple queens, but the entire social order of the colony had been changed. This was a new social structure of ant colonies based on a single change in one letter in the DNA alphabet of these ants. So clearly at the level of where we study populations of people, twins, and show that they're characteristics behaviorally are related to their backgrounds genetically. We can study animals and change their genes or observe naturalistic changes in genes with amazing effects on complex behaviors. This was all sort of virtual and, and experimental until the human genome sequence was resolved in the early, early part of this century. Every field of medicine thinks that the human genome, both of the work of the Human Genome Project, has a unique import in the field of medicine. What I want you today is that there is no field that will be more profoundly changed by knowing the human genetic sequence than the field of mental illness. The reason for this is that we don't know what mental illnesses are. We know what cancer is. We may not have found all the cancer genes, but we know what cancer is. We know what every cancer gene will do. We have to find that, we have to use that information to cure cancer, but we fundamentally know that every cancer gene will disrupt how the cell cycle works, the biology of cells. We know this about cancer. We have no idea, fundamentally, at the basic level of our cells, which is the building blocks of our bodies, we have no idea what the basis of mental illness is. And genes represent the first absolutely objective clues to what mental illnesses really are. Now this is my bias and my view, but I'm not the only person who thinks that understanding genes represents a huge breakthrough in biomedical science, particularly with respect to mental illness. For example, the editors of the same journal I mentioned to you, Science, the most prestigious scientific journal in the world, at the end of the year, the editors of science pick what they consider to be the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of the year. In 2003, as genes were beginning to emerge from mental illness, and we were beginning to develop strategies for understanding how genes affected your brain so that they increased your likelihood of manifesting mental illness, the editors of science decided that the number two scientific breakthrough of the year second only 
to the origins of the cosmos was genes for mental illness. Now this may be overdoing it a little bit, but it certainly was a statement that this was an enormous sea change in thinking about progress for understanding the basic causes of, the, of these most disabling and serious of human uh, disorders. So let me try and put this in a little more broad and specific context with respect to mental illness. Why are genes important in mental illness? Well, there are several reasons for this. The first is that from twin and adoption studies and family studies, over 50 years of studies, we knew that most of the risk for all major psychiatric illnesses, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, phobic and anxious states, most of the variation in risk in the human species was accounted for by genes and nothing else accounted for more variance in risk. Genes transcend phenomenological diagnosis. All the diagnoses we make in psychiatry are based on phenomenological observations or reports of individuals, not any basic understanding of the biology or the pathophysiology of the causes or the, the actual nature of the disease. It's all based on what we see, what we think, what we hear. Genes, by definition, represent mechanisms of disease. It's not to say that they represent the only thing that's important in the mechanism of disease, but they represent a very discrete, objective, certain element in the mechanisms of disease. Genes also clarify the environment. It's often been said that one of the reasons you study genes is so you can finally understand the environment, because everybody has a different biological toolbox, which is their genes, by which they build the house that they live in in their environment. So everybody's environment, everybody's not experienced the same environment the same way. And part of that variance in how you feel about your environment is your genetic background. Genes are the first absolutely objective means by which we can identify people who are at risk. At risk to manifest illness, at risk to have uh, different variations in outcome. Because genes are absolutely objective, they represent objective ways of characterizing risk people. And then finally, genes are entry points into the biology of how cells work. Genes are about two things. They're about fixed traits that you inherit from your parents, whether you have blonde hair and blue eyes. But they're also about the blueprint for how a cell operates at every moment in the life of the cell. Because the genes represent the blueprint for every protein a cell makes and how a cell responds to things that are changing in its environment. And because genes are entry points into this complex cellular biology, genes are potentially clues to the discovery of new therapeutic targets that are in these pathways. Let me try to bring this to a more specific realm of discussion with respect to one mental disorder, which is the cancer of mental illness, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a very serious chronic disorder of cognition, perception, and many aspects of human behavior. Its onset is typically in early adulthood. It causes, for most individuals who are afflicted by it, a lifetime of disability. According to the World Health Organization, it is one of the 10 most disabling illnesses of human beings in world societies. In fact, four of the 10 most costly and disabling of human disorders and illnesses are mental disorders. The estimated costs, economic costs in the USA are alone in terms of lost productivity and, and, and cost of health care is in excess of $50 billion a year. So clearly trying to get a hold of schizophrenia is a top priority public health uh, problem. What causes schizophrenia? Because ultimately the best way to tackle this problem is to understand its cause. There have been many things that have been studied in the past 50 years as possible causes of schizophrenia. And many of these things come from studying populations of people who have schizophrenia and looking for what's different about them from populations of people who don't have schizophrenia. And I don't want to go into each of these things, but these are all things that have been argued as representing, in, a, in the culture, risk factors for schizophrenia. And most of these things are identified from large so-called population studies that are done in a country where you look at the entire registry of people who are ill in the country and try to differentiate what, what was associated with risk for illness and what was not. The problem with all these things, as valid as they are, with the exception of the one in blue at the bottom, genetic predisposition, 
is that it's been very hard to know in any of this what the chicken is and what the egg is. And this is where genes are different because by definition, genes are the egg. So let me first give you a very brief lesson in how we find genes. Because the fact that we could now actually look in a person's blood, take DNA out of their blood cells, and actually analyze their DNA sequence, all the little letters in the DNA alphabet, we could make determinations of whether there were differences in how the, the letters, the words were spelled, the genes were spelled, in people with one illness or one trait, and compared to people with another trait. Genes are found by a technique called genetic association. And a gene is said to be associated with a trait. And the trait can be anything. The trait can be blue eyes, can be an illness, it can be height, it can be intelligence. When a variant in the gene, because everybody, we don't look the same, we don't act the same, we don't all score exactly the same on all the tests we take, but we all have eyes, we all have ears, we all have noses, we all have lungs and hearts and brains. The characteristics that vary between all of us are because of variations in the letters in the DNA alphabet. So when we look in populations that have one trait or another, we look for whether a variant in a particular gene is found with increased frequency in a population who is enriched with the trait that we're trying to study and find genes for. So here we have two populations, and the men and women have different symbols in these populations, represented by these two different rows. One population was selected because it had the blue trait, whatever that is. It's a totally made-up, fictitious trait. The other population was selected because it didn't have the blue trait. And underneath each of these people is the letters that make up a particular part of the DNA alphabet with respect to two genes. If you look at the blue letters, the C gene, there's absolutely no difference between the two populations in those letters. And we would say that nothing about the C gene seems to explain whether people have the blue trait or not. If you look at the letters that make up the A gene, there is a difference. Because there are more capital A's in the group that have the blue trait than the group that have that don't have the blue trait. This is the strategy by which geneticists find genes that seem to be related to a particular characteristic of human beings. And in this study, it would be said that the capital A form of this gene is associated with the blue trait. This strategy has been used now for the past 10 years in looking at populations of people with a variety of mental illnesses. And at least in schizophrenia, it has been remarkably successful. I don't intend any of you to commit to memory this <laughs> slide. And it's not be intended for you to commit to memory. All it's intended to do is be very busy and to show you that a lot is happening at the level of discovering genes for schizophrenia. There are over 15 genes now that look like at least many of them and the majority of them will turn out to be bona fide risk factors in producing schizophrenia in human beings. Psychiatric genetics, and particularly schizophrenia genetics, is arguably one of the most, if not the most, successful efforts in complex medical genetics. Much more successful than diabetes, much more successful than obesity, much more successful than high blood pressure, stroke, or heart disease, even though orders of magnitude more money has been spent on looking for genes for these other disorders which are much less costly and disabling to our society than our mental disorders, but the search for psychiatric genes so far has been remarkably successful in identifying candidates for likely susceptibility genes. Now, I've shown you this slide, and when I show this slide to my colleagues in the world of genetics, they don't exactly nod their heads and a lot of this stuff. And the fact is, this is fairly controversial. And in some settings, in some settings, this can lead to a very angry response from the audience. Uh, I love this slide. I mean, I, I just feel like you know, this slide works in almost any setting. <laughs> and what's the problem here? Why, why is this so controversial? Well, because we're at a wine festival, I thought we could put this in the context of the, of the glass being half full or half empty. 
Now, I have to tell you, I am an NIH scientist. And one of the things that's happened at NIH in the past few years is that there's been a, uh, a vigilante effort to cleanse the NIH of any relationships with the private sector of our world. And therefore, I'm not proud of this, by the way, and I don't even advocate what's happened. But I have zero industry relationships or biotechnology relationships of any kind, so I can't disclose any hidden agendas in what I tell you. But I do have to disclose a bias. And the bias is that I think the glass is half full. And the talk I'm, going to, I'm giving you is based on this bias that the, the glass is half full. The reason many people think the glass is half empty is that they just point out that when you look at this literature, when you go through these genes, there's a lot of inconsistency at the level of the science that associates these genes with this illness. Those of us who see the glass half full would argue that we expect inconsistencies. Even when we look at, me at medical genetic problems where no one has vicious AK-47 wielding arguments, <laughs> such as cystic fibrosis, which everybody knows is genetic, and the genes for cystic fibrosis are genes for your fate. The genes for mental disorders, like the genes for cancer and heart disease and obesity and diabetes, are genes for risk. They're not genes for fate. They don't give you diseases. They change how much at risk you are for a disease. But even in diseases like cystic fibrosis, where the gene absolutely determines that you get the disease, there are almost 1,500 changes that have been described to date in the cystic fibrosis gene across people around the world that can produce cystic fibrosis. There's nothing consistent about the molecular genetics of cystic fibrosis. And in fact, this is what we expect of psychiatric disorders. This is a slide to illustrate a critical point in understanding complex genetic conditions like diabetes and heart disease and obesity and all mental disorders, which are very common, but they're complex because they're heterogeneous and they're polygenic. And the genes don't guarantee that you have the disease. Other things have to happen. The people here that are in this shaded, each of these circles represents an individual. And it says something about their genetic architecture, because we're made up of 20 some odd thousand genes. And everybody that has this, this shading in the circle has the disease or a trait. But the thing to notice is that every person with the trait does not have exactly the same constellation of genes because different genes can combine with each other. There are some people that have all the genes, like here in the lower right-hand corner, I don't know if you can see this, but don't have the trait because the genes are not fully penetrant at the clinical level. There are other things that can compensate for the gene effects. And then there are, um, there's no one constellation of genes that guarantees this particular phenotype, which is the clinical manifestation of this, in every person who has the phenotype. This is the nature of, of the disorders being polygenic, multiple genes interacting and combining, and it being heterogeneous. There's no one signature collection of genes, or what we call genotypes, that accounts for this. There are other reasons for the complexity. Why are genes for psychiatric disorders so controversial? Why is it so complicated? Well, one reason for this is that genes do not encode for psychiatric phenomena. Genes which encode proteins and cells do not encode, they don't represent the blueprint for psychopathology. What do genes represent? Well, this is a schema of thinking about how you go from a gene to a complex behavior such as schizophrenia. If we start on the left-hand side of this slide, you inherit in your genetic background subtle variations in the sequence code, the letters of the, of the DNA alphabet. Those subtle variations do not encode for behavior. They encode for simple molecules in cells. That's all they do. The DNA only knows from the simple machinery of building primarily proteins in cells. Once the proteins are built, the gene has done its thing. If you inherit variations in genes that affect the building and processing of proteins, the cell deals with those proteins to build its own architecture and to determine its lifetime biology. Cells, particularly in your brain, form contacts with other cells. Cells are very social in the brain. They elaborate processes, they make contacts, 
and they talk to other cells. If you inherit variations in the genetic code of the cell, which affects the manufactured processing of proteins in the cell, the way the cell interacts with its neighbors will be slightly altered. It won't hear all the signals correctly. It might elaborate its tentacles that talk to other cells slightly in a different way. And that's what cells do. But cells participate over development in the elaboration of a brain, which is made up of systems of cells, which we call neural circuits and neural systems. Cells process molecular information. Neural systems in the brain process sensory information, cognitive information, emotional information. And ultimately, behavior is the emergent properties, the emergent phenomena of this level of differing levels of information processing, ultimately at the level of processing environmental information. If we try to understand the effects of genes at the level of behavior, it's going to be increasingly diluted in terms of its penetrance or how much it shows effects as we move through these, these increasingly biological steps. Here's another way of thinking about this. Behavior is the symphony that the orchestra has to produce. There is a musical score which, is the, which encodes the behavior of the elements of the orchestra. The musical code is the DNA. The, 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 the musical code is only adapted by the individual instrumentalists. These are the cells. The code is used by every instrumentalist in the orchestra. The instrumentalists are part of systems. The woodwinds, the brass, the percussion. And ultimately, all of this has to work together to produce music. Because the music requires something more than the code, the cells, and the systems. And so this is, I think, a way of, of thinking about this uh, in terms of behavior and genes. Let me put this in the context of one very specific gene and illustrate, again, how this gets to different levels of complexity relating genes to human uh, psychiatric conditions. One of the, um, the um, godfathers of the NIMH, and in fact its first Nobel laureate, was Julie Axelrod, uh, who died last year. Julie Axelrod was very interested in neurotransmission. And one of the things he discovered was an enzyme that was critical for the metabolism of many of the neurotransmitters that we've been interested in psychiatry for a long time, particularly dopamine and norepinephrine, but also estrogen, caffeine. It was, an es it was a gene called catecholomethyltransferase, or COMT. COMT has been studied very extensively in psychiatry to try to understand how a variation in the gene which affects the function of the enzyme that COMT is. COMT is a gene which is represented on this part of the human genome in the 22nd chromosome. And this schematic illustration sort of tries to bring you to the concept of thinking about a gene which sits on a chromosome and has different functional elements in it. And there's one little letter in the, tw in the 28,000 letters of the COMT gene that affects how the protein is built based on the code of this gene. And it affects how you put together the string of amino acids that makes this protein. And this one little letter is altered in a substantial population of human beings to change the amino acid code. This changes the activity of the enzyme. And for a variety of reasons, because of its role in dopamine, because of where it is on the 22nd chromosome, people have studied this gene extensively. And one of the things that's emerged from these studies is that the gene very reliably and strongly predicts how certain parts of your brain work. This has been studied with imaging, which is schematized at the bottom here. Neuroimaging, where we look with a variety of techniques like functional magnetic resonance imaging at how your brain is working physiologically while you're engaged in solving puzzles or problems. It's also been studied cognitively. And what it's shown is, depending on which form of the gene you have, how many of one amino acid uh, variant or the other you have predicts how well a particular part of your brain called the frontal lobe works when you handle frontal lobe related pr uh, problems like working memory. And this has been a very strong characteristic of this gene. This gene affects how your frontal lobe works. How your frontal lobe works has also been of great interest in schizophrenia because patients with schizophrenia have trouble with how their frontal lobe works. It's also been found, actually, that people who are genetically at risk 
for how your frontal lobe works. Studies done, for example, by the Stagley professor at UCLA, uh, Ty Cannon, has something to do with how genetically at risk for schizophrenia you are. So the fact that COMT as a gene in human beings affects how well our frontal lobe works and how our frontal lobe works is related to schizophrenia and whether you're at increased genetic risk of schizophrenia would suggest that COMT has a lot to do with whether you're schizophrenic or not. But it turns out it doesn't. Turns out that COMT has a lot to do with how cells handle dopamine, particularly in the cortex, and it predicts pretty well the impact of that effect on how effectively your frontal lobe works. But when it comes to trying to predict how likely you are to have schizophrenia, it's very, very weak. It's not really valuable from a clinical perspective. So why is this? Well, this is one of the reasons that people keep pointing at this glass being half empty. They say, yeah, well, where are you going with this stuff? I mean, this looks really cool. You're getting a lot of papers. You're getting grants. But are you really changing anyone's life? Well, so it's a very good question. Why do we have such good data about COMT being penetrant, meaning we can predict people's behavior at the level of how your brain works, but we can't get it to predict this complex state of psychosis schizophrenia? Well, maybe, it's, maybe there's more to it than that. Well, maybe the environment matters. And the environment clearly matters. Let me tell of why the environment has to matter. Genes interact with the environment to modify the expression of their individual effects. Genes modify the environment, and the environment modifies the effects of your genes. This can lead to exaggerated effects, compensated effects, or even novel effects. Let me show you a dramatic example of this with potential public health implications. This is data from a scientific experiment that was done in the South Island of New Zealand, where they followed a thousand children for 25 years as part of a public health study in the South Island of New Zealand. And because most people don't like to leave the South Island of New Zealand, if you've ever been there, you wouldn't want to leave it either. Um, they have the opportunity to follow these people. And about 90% of them were still there for 25 years. And because they were part of a public health study, every year or two, they came in and they were evaluated. And they were evaluated in a variety of ways. And these investigators went back to find out who had a psychotic episode, who, who had a schizophrenia-like episode over those 25 years. And they made two interesting observations. The first is the dark bar represents the effect of whether you had, were a marijuana smoker by the time you got to age 14. There are about five studies now in populations around the world that have shown that if you're a marijuana smoker, by the time you get to age 14, you have a slightly increased risk of, of manifesting schizophrenia as an adult. Now, we don't know, this is a kind of association study, observational study. We don't know if the marijuana is doing something to your brain before age 14 that causes an increased risk of schizophrenia, or whether the people who are already at increased risk of schizophrenia because of many other things in, in their brain development are using marijuana earlier in life because it helps them in certain ways or because they can't resist it. I'm actually, uh, I, I love to tell the story. I told this, um, this study to my son, actually, uh, about him. I was actually trying to counsel him. He was already about, he was about 19 when I told this story. His, his reaction was, whew. <laughs> so I took that as good news. Anyway. Um, but the other amazing observation they made was that whether, whether marijuana use by age 14 impacted on your risk for manifesting schizophrenia by the time you got to be 25 was critically dependent on which form of COMT you inherited from your parents. And if you look here under the MET-MET form of the gene, which is the gene form that's associated with better frontal lobe function, if you have the MET-MET form of the gene, COMT does nothing, I mean, marijuana use does nothing to you. If you have the VAL form of the gene, it has a dramatically enhanced effect on your risk. And in fact, if you have a VAL-VAL genotype, which is both forms of the gene being the VAL amino acid form, your risk of having schizophrenia from early childhood marijuana use relative to the general population, at least in the South Island of New Zealand, was increased tenfold. This is a huge effect 
It has been looked, replicated now in two or three other samples where the odds ratio, the effect is four to five fold, but these are potentially public health implication data. Well, but you know, the people who see the glasses half empty say, but still, you know, there are plenty of people who don't use marijuana and plenty of people that don't have these COFD effects that still manifest schizophrenia. It's not good enough. So, the other thing to remember is that genes don't only interact with the environment, they also interact with each other to modify the expression of their individual effects. This also can lead to exaggerated compensated novel effects. Nobody has one gene. When we study COMT and its effect even in the context of marijuana use or not, we're still looking for a prediction of very, very profound changes in human adaptation based on variation in one tiny little gene. We have 20 some odd thousand genes. So genes have to interact with each other. And the effect that a gene has on something as complicated as behavior will be affected by what other genes are doing in your background. So let me illustrate this point with two other genes that have been on the top 10 list of candidate susceptibility genes for disorders related to mood and anxiety. And these genes are the gene that encodes the protein that is the target of all antidepressant drugs, the so-called serotonin transporter, which has this code as its gene name. The serotonin transporter is the, is the protein that all the Prozacs of this world target to try to improve symptoms of anxiety and depression. The other gene I'm going to talk about, which has also been implicated in mood disorders and the mechanism of action of antidepressant, anti-anxiety drugs, is a gene that I like to think of as the poster child, the molecular poster child for, for neuroplasticity, which is BDNF or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And I want to illustrate how the effect of these genes is critically dependent on the combination of, of variants in the two genes. So let me first tell you a little bit about what we've learned about how the serotonin transport gene relates to mood and anxiety. We've known from pharmacological studies and from studies in genetically engineered animals that serotonin is a lot about the expression of fear in an animal and in human beings. All drugs that are anti-anxiety and antidepressant drugs target in one way or another aspects of the serotonin system. When we genetically engineer mice to have perturbations in the serotonin transporter, these mice have a lifetime of fearfulness. And this has led to the assumption that serotonin in the brain has something about how fearful you are. And people have looked for associations of genes in the serotonin system and fearful temperament with some very limited success. We've also known from many animal studies that there are critical neural circuits in the brain that use serotonin to determine how much threat there is in your environment. And the system that's critical about this, this is actually uh, one of the Marvel Comics' worst villains, is amygdala. And the system in the brain that is critical for how you take sensory information from your environment and determine how much danger you're in is the amygdala. So this led us to think that maybe we could take the strategy of not looking at the relationship of this gene to behavior, but looking to the relationship of this gene to how you would experience danger in your environment at the level of how your brain works. And we did a study, again using an imaging paradigm called functional magnetic resonance imaging, to look at how threatening people felt the experience of a frightened person in their environment was. Human beings, like all primates, are critically tuned in to the expression of strong, particularly negative anger and fear, emotion, on the faces of animals of their species. And when you see a frightened person, it gives you a little bit of a squirrely feeling. Your pulse rate goes up, your skin conductance goes up. If you were to take a lie detector test, you would show an adverse, you know, a negative uh, signal. So we just did a study where we had people in MRI scan. These are all normal people. People who have never been to a psychiatrist, never taken a, a, an antidepressant drug, never had a depression. And we showed him a frightened face. And we asked him to match the frightened face to one of two other faces showing a similar emotion. And we didn't say to him, we're studying your amygdala, we want you to turn your amygdala on. The fact is, you have no conscious control over your amygdala. You don't know where it is, you don't know what it's doing from one moment to the other. The only time you're aware of its presence is when you feel frightened. And what this does, as shown by this elliptical circle, is when you show people this face, their amygdala is turned on. 
And this engages your amygdala, and, and they get a sweaty palm. So now we had a phenotype. We had a measure of the responsiveness of a brain system to perceive danger in the environment that would alert you to being potentially frightened. And we had a gene that we knew from animal studies impacted on how this system worked. So we can generate a scientific hypothesis about how genetic variation in this gene should affect how our amygdalas responded when we were confronted with something in our environment that might be dangerous, that would alert us to the possibility of danger. And the assumption was, just as every mouse that's put out in an open field, which is very scary for a mouse, because there are eagles up there that are looking at those open fields, and mice learn instinctively that being out in the open is really a bad place to be. Every human being that goes to something like the Blair Witch Project doesn't find it equally frightening. Some think people think it's boring, some people think it's totally cool, and other people can't sleep for a week. We thought that some of the variation in how people experience this stuff has to do with the sensitivity of their amygdala to being aroused by potential threat in the environment. And we thought that some of this would be explained by variation in this gene which impacts on the function of serotonin transmissibility. And we did, we've done five studies on this now. There are about seven studies in the literature now. Everyone finding exactly the same thing. That variation in this gene determines the sensitivity of human beings' amygdala to respond to environmental stimuli which could connote threat. Now, when we, we did these studies, we were actually, we were amazed, of course, that it worked at all. But we were struck by the fact that this was an experiment where we looked at how responsive people's amygdalas were during their, the, the experience of a signal in the environment that might be threatening to them. But this was being done in a three-minute experiment in an MRI scanner. If this was something about the genetic programming of people's amygdalas, this is something that had also happened to them many other times in their life, every time they were experiencing discomfort, threat, danger in the environment. In fact, this has been happening to them from day one, from the first time they experienced any sensory information. So we wondered whether this was not only a physiological response of the amygdala, but something about the wiring from early in development of this system that regulates how threatening you feel the environment is. So we did another study. This was a study of 114 normal people who had never been to a psychiatrist, never taken a psychiatric drug, no drugs of abuse, absolutely as, as clean from the psychiatric perspective as we could find. We even matched 100 parts of their genome so that we could say that they didn't represent different ancestral populations. And we asked the computer to survey the entire brain that we got from a brain imaging study. This was a study of brain structure for where variation in the serotonin gene would make a difference for the development of your brain. And the computer does not read the genetics literature of psychiatry. It knows nothing about serotonin in your brain. It doesn't know anything about where the serotonin goes. But what it discovered was that there were two regions of the brain where having this change in this gene affected the development of your brain. One was the amygdala, and the other was this part of the brain called the cingular cortex, which is a critical system for regulating the response of the amygdala to the environment. In fact, this is the part of the brain that hears from the amygdala and shuts it off. This is the part of the brain that says, I got your message, I recognize that you think there's danger here, but you know something, I've given tons of talks, I, even though I'm speaking to a group of total strangers, I don't have to be anxious about this because I've had enough experience to know that this amygdala signal can be shut down now. And this is how you get over a moment of anxiety. You cut down on this stimulus. These, this thing mapped to areas of the brain that are critically involved in regulating the experience of negative emotion of the environment. The amazing thing about this spot, which the computer came up with, based on a brain image, is that the computer did not know that when people have looked at actual brains of human beings and looked at where serotonin was in the brain, this spot is the densest innervation of serotonin nerves in the human brain. And this is a critical part of the brain for regulating how, you assume, how threatening the environment feels to you. So in other words, 
the serotonin transporter gene, the gene that encodes the protein that we target with all of our, uh, our antidepressant drugs, while it may have something ultimately to do with depression and anxiety, what it has to do with at the level of human brain biology is that it determines in part, because there obviously is one gene, the development and function of the system in the brain that generates negative emotional experience in the environment. So, that looks good. We have this finding of a variation of gene that affects the cells that have to do with serotonin and affects the circuitry in the brain that has to do with the amygdala, and it's a very robust, consistent finding. But let's see again, how does it do when it predicts anxiety and depression? Not very good. So this is, again, the same old problem. When you try to look at this at the level of behavior, other things seem to get in the way of this prediction at the, from gene to complex behavior. Why is this? Well, one possibility, obviously the environment's important, and I've already illustrated that, that this environment's very important with this gene too, but in the interest of time, I'm going to not take up the environment here. No one has only one gene. And maybe there are other genes that interact with this gene that affect how strong the prediction of behavior is from studying the one gene. Genes interact with each other, of course, also with the environment, to modify the expression of the individual effects. This can lead to exaggerated, compensated, or novel effects. We were very interested in the likelihood that one of the genes that would critically interact with the serotonin gene was BDNF. Because we know that serotonin changes cells in part by turning on BDNF. We studied BDNF in the same way we study a lot of these other genes, and BDNF also affects how your brain develops. BDNF is very much involved in adaptations that the brain makes in learning and experience, particularly with respect to learning and memory. And what we've shown, and others have confirmed this, actually both in humans and in mice now, that this, there's a variation in the BDNF gene that affects the function of this gene and the processing of this gene in cells that affects elements of brain development. And in fact, if you inherit one form of this gene that we showed called the MET form of this gene that is not handled normally by cells, parts of your brain that are critically involved in learning and memory don't develop quite as completely as if you inherit forms of the gene that are processed more normally by the cell. Then we've looked at the relationship of BDNF and behavior. And there are a number of studies that have looked at the relationship of BDNF with aspects of human temperament. Here's an, as uh, an aspect of human temperament having to do with anxiety and neuroticism, and also with respect to mood, mood disorders like bipolar disorder. And most of these studies, at least the ones that have been positive, have come up with a paradoxical result. And the result is that the form of BDNF that is handled normally by cells is the form that increases your risk for depression. The form of the gene that is handled abnormally by cells and that we show is related to a less complete development of parts of your brain shown with the, with the striking colors here related to learning and memory, etc., seems to be protective, seems to protect you. How can this be? Why would the BDNF normal form of the gene be the form that increases your risk for depression. Now this is a very complicated slide, but I just want to draw your attention to the red bar here. This is a slide that shows that cells are always responding to a neurochemical milieu. And they respond by making molecular adaptations to changes in the milieu. And at the very upper left-hand corner of this slide, there is a serotonin receptor. Antidepressants which target the serotonin transporter protein affect the amount of serotonin that's impinging on this cell. And when serotonin impinges on the cell, it gives the cell a signal which says, hey, there's a lot of serotonin here. Do what you do when you hear serotonin. And one of the things the cell does, it pours out BNF. BNF is a signal that tells the cell that gave it serotonin, I like that stuff. Give me more of that stuff. And the cell makes an adaptation so that it's innervation that is, the degree to which cells make contacts with each other, is altered because BDNF signals that it likes serotonin. One of the things that we showed with the serotonin genetic variation that we studied, that we showed was involved with the development of parts of the brain involved in learning and memory, which is on this slide, was that the MET form of the gene, which was not good for you in terms of brain development related to memory, 
was probably in part not good for you because it didn't respond to the signals like serotonin that allowed it to grow and develop the normal circuitry of these kinds of adaptations. But this raises another possibility that illustrates the complexity of how genes interact with each other. While the BDNF valve form was the healthier form for the building of experience-based learning and memory systems, it was also the form that would hear serotonin related to stress and anxiety very clearly and build stress and anxiety mediating systems from early in development. The met form of the gene is death to serotonin. It doesn't hear serotonin. And if serotonin signaling related to the one form of the serotonin gene is critical for using BDNF to sculpt from early in life anxiety prone neural circuitries, the met form of BDNF will protect you from that because it doesn't hear that signal to build these stress mediating, stress exaggerating systems. So we could test this very directly in living human beings and normal human beings by taking this finding, which was the effect of the anxiety form of the serotonin transporter gene and its effect on the development of this circuitry and testing it directly in people who had the death, the serotonin death form of BDNF and the serotonin hearing form of BDNF. And this is what we've done and these are the data. And it's exactly as predicted by the molecular biology in cells. If you inherit the form of the serotonin gene, called the S form, that is associated with the development of the circuitry that enhances the experience of threat and risk in the environment, and you have a valve form of BDNF, which is the normal form of BDNF, you will exaggerate the circuitry. You will grow this anxiety-prone circuitry with a vengeance. If you have the met form of this gene, you are completely protected against this effect of probably early serotonin signaling early in life. This is an illustration of how genes interact to produce complicated results, but approachable, definable, objectively discernible effects in human beings. Let me give you another way of thinking about this. Here we have two genes. But I'm going to illustrate two genes that have two forms. We call, Genesis call these forms alleles. Here's an engine gene. One form of the engine gene is a race car. The other form of the engine gene is a jalopy. Here's another gene, which is the crew gene. One form of the crew gene is a race team crew gene. The other form of the crew gene is the three stooges. Now, genes interact with each other. To, to enhance or modify their effects. So what are the kinds of combinations we could have here? Well, we could have this crew gene combined with this crew engine, and we would have no problems. This, this would have a particular personality, characteristics. It'd be, you know, it would be novelty-seeking, it would be thrill-seeking, it would be very fast, flashy, et cetera. It might involve might like gambling and a lot of other things. <laughs> we have another combination of genes. This also has no problem. But this has a very different temperament and personality. But these are not the only combinations we could have, obviously. So we can have this combination. Now, this combination would have a different personality. But basically, there'd be no problem. There'd be no crashes. And this would not really disturb society very much. Although there might be a lot of neurosis here, because this combination could lead to a person that would never be quite comfortable with themselves. But there'd be no crashes. This is a big problem. <laughs> so, let me just conclude by, by, by asking the, the question, because this is always asked of genes, where will genes take us in psychiatry? And there are a number of, of places that we hope genes will take us. Uh, will they make di diagnoses valid? I doubt that we will diagnose mental illness based on genes. Because as I've already shown you, the genes are not about mental illness. The genes are about aspects of how a brain develops and functions to process different kinds of environmental experience. The genes are about how the environment feels to you and how you can adapt to it. Uh, but it may help us refine some of the imprecision in the diagnosis that we make. Will it lead to primary prevention? Will we be able to identify people who are at risk 
and be able to prevent them from ever manifesting disease? I don't think we know the answer to this. I think the glass is half full or half empty on this one. There are many people who think you'll never have enough uh, prediction value to use genes to prevent illness. I'm not so sure about that. My guess is we will, with certain combinations of genes, be able to predict in certain settings probably 30% of the risk that somebody has for a psychotic episode between the age of 20 and 25. That is a huge, uh, uh, that is of huge value. Doesn't allow you to predict the majority of the risk, but if we knew who was at 30 to 40 percent risk, we could target those people at critical times of life for very special help and intervention. I think we will. We have, don't know the answer to this yet. This is something we'll explore. No question, the genes tell us what the diseases are, and these are the first objective clues. This is such a sea change in thinking about research about mental illness. Genes bring mental illnesses into the mainstream of biomedical science. This is something we have been trying to do for 30 years. One of the great um, uh, uh, results of things like the Staglin Family uh, Vineyards Music Festival and all the private uh, commitment to research in mental illness is that it's had this enormous impact on the destigmatization of mental illness. But ultimately, the greatest uh, uh, effect on destigmatization is by understanding the science of these diseases. These diseases are more and more, we used to say this, but we never had real good data to prove it. We used to say it's like diabetes, it's like epilepsy, it's like, but now it is. These genes, one thing about these genes don't, these gene, the human genome did not evolve to substantiate the DSM-4 diagnostic criteria. These genes are the same. And genes do affect the biology of treatment response. We already know, for example, with COMT, there's five studies now showing that COMT has value in predicting the cognitive response to antipsychotic drugs. The serotonin gene I showed you about has predictive value in who tolerates SSRI drugs, antidepressant drugs. So these, these genes are already beginning to help us. It ma makes some sense out of variation in outcome. Um, the last point to be made is that because gene, we're not going to change people's genes. And all of these variants in the genes exist in people who have no classic psychiatric diagnoses. Because these genes are not about psychiatric diagnoses. They're about the flavors of human brain development and function. But we can use these genes to find the molecular pathways in cells that are ultimately disrupted to make the systems in the brain function abnormally. And there will be targets for the development of new drugs uh, in these various genes. Uh, so I think we will, in the next generation of science, see the first drugs emerge, as we already heard. Every drug that we use to treat mental illness was discovered serendipitously. There is not one drug that was discovered, some of them are very effective, not one drug that was discovered because of a basic understanding of the causes of these diseases. There's no question that we will make progress, real progress, because we now have clues to the basic causes of these diseases. Einstein said, nature is subtle, but not malicious. It would be malicious if the only drugs that we could find were from accident and none, no meaningful, significant therapies would emerge from the first truly uh, real uh, clues to the cause of these diseases. Before finishing, I just want to put up some names because I like to say my job at the NIH is primarily answering email. Um, these are the people. These are the people who actually did this work, and I just want to mention some of these people. The take-home message here is that the search for susceptibility genes for psychiatric disorders is arguably one of the most successful efforts in complex medical genetics. Even though it's been funded at probably two orders of magnitude less than all these other efforts, which are not quite as sexy and don't get as much play in the press, uh, although they're certainly less. That no more debilitating. The genes tell us what the disorders are at a basic cellular level. The current evidence converges on subtle molecular bottlenecks in diverse aspects of how nerves talk to each other, which is through synapses, and brain development related to the neural circuitry of cognition and emotion. Therapeutic advances will emerge from a thorough understanding of the molecular biology of susceptibility genes and the neural circuitry that they influence. I believe we are standing on a uh, on the threshold of an enormous sea change, uh, and um, 
uh, uh, new era in, in, in psychiatry. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, So, uh, Danny would be happy to answer questions, and we have plenty of time for questions, and then at the end, we'll introduce Dr. Anton, and then we'll go, those of us who are invited to go to the caves, will go to the caves and proceed with the day. Okay, so, please, I'll, I'll bring the mic to you. You mentioned at the beginning uh, something about identical twins. Uh, we have identical twin granddaughters who, from the day of birth exhibited greatly differing uh, aspects of how of their behavior. Have you used those studies uh, to some success? Um, there's been a lot of studies of trying to understand what is the shared um, uh, behaviors and biology of identical twins and what are not shared because clearly there are aspects to being twins that are not shared. Um, what is shared is the DNA alphabet. What's not shared is aspects of environment, and the environment of identical twins actually is not identical. It may be actually much more identical after they're born than it is before they're born, because part of being an identical twin is that you have to share the same placenta and they're usually not shared identically. So there are differences that twins experience prior to birth. Actually, after birth, they're probably surprisingly more similar. So there are clearly environmental effects that will determine some of the variation in twin behavior. There's a lot of interest in this. I think most of the studies that have been done to date in twins have been to use them to understand what is inherited, uh, what is shared, I was late, so I apologize if you have to repeat the answer. Last year you said in identical twins that you felt it was not genetic. Do you still hold that same opinion? Well, there's, there's, there's clearly things in identical twins that happen differently between them that is not genetic. One of the things, we, we originally started doing genetic studies in schizophrenia by studying identical twins. And one of the things that people know about identical twins, where one twin has schizophrenia, is that the odds are about 50-50 that the other twin will not have schizophrenia. So this has always made the point that just having the genes is not enough. The 50-50 likelihood is still much, much greater than it is, for example, among siblings. Because siblings will have at most about a 5% probability. If one sibling has schizophrenia, for example, the other sibling has at most a 1 in 20, 1 in 15 chance of having schizophrenia. Whereas in twins, it's 50-50. So when you share the exact same genome, you have a much greater likelihood of having schizophrenia if you have a twin with schizophrenia. But you don't have a perfect likelihood, which means that genes are very important. But as is true for most common medical disorders, not the rare genetic disorders like Huntington's disease and cystic fibrosis where the genes tell the whole story. In all common medical disorders, genes are a very important part of the story, but they don't tell the whole story. So genes determine what, how much at risk you are, but they don't determine what your fate is. Oh, I'll come get you. Thanks very much. I was very interested in the kind of split between the half full and the half empty um, analogy. And I'm wondering, for people who say the glass is half empty and that this is not a productive strategy. Why is that? Is it because there's a perception that uh, there's with so many determinants, genetic determinants, that you can't try to develop any meaningful clinical or therapeutic strategies? Or is it that whatever the genetic predisposition to risk is, that it's just swamped by the environmental factors? Well, that's actually a very important question. There's no one reason that the glass half empty um, 
world says the glass is empty? There's a number of reasons. You've hit on two of them. I mean, the, the data from adoption studies and the data from twin studies is that actually, with respect to most major psychiatric disorders, environment is a minimal factor in determining risk of variance. Actually, environment, environment may be very important in individuals, but across unrelated people, or in, in, in samples of twin studies, it's actually a minor, minor factor compared to genes. Now, the other reason, of course, is that it is very complicated. I think there's a lot of reasons that, that there's a half glass half empty. Traditional geneticists, traditional medical geneticists who were raised on Mendelian principles of genetics have generally, in my experience, been slow to understand genetics that is of common complex medical disorders, where the biology of genetic effects is very different than it is when you have major effect genes in so-called common, rare Mendelian disorders of, of humans. And I think that's been one resistance, to understand it's a much more complex biology. And I think that's been one level of resistance. I think there are other levels of resistance in that it is very complicated. It may turn out that there are so many factors at the genetic level that it's hard to know it's where to dive into it. But I think that's a sort of a, a nihilistic view because you have to dive into it because these are the first clues without, by an order, by, you know, the, the, these make everything that came before it, um, you know, in, just curiosities. This, these are clues to the basic causes of these diseases. They are completely objective. Genes are bounded so that we can ask we can ask concrete questions about them. We can define them objectively. We can sequence them. We can look at variations. We can study how they function, how they process. We can build models. It's very hard to do this about issues of the environment because one person's stress is another person's challenge. And it's very hard to quantify all these other elements until we have the genetics worked out. You know, there's a great story in Parkinson's disease. There's a gene that was discovered in a rare Italian family called alpha synuclein that was the explanation for Parkinson's disease in this rare family. And everybody went back to all their patients with Parkinson's disease and they looked for whether there were de defects in this gene. Nobody found anything. Just forget it. Nobody else could find any person with Parkinson's disease outside this family, very rare exceptions, that had a defect in this gene. This gene has turned out to be a fundamental target for the development of new therapies for Parkinson's disease. Because even though most people with Parkinson's disease don't have a problem with that gene, the pathway that the gene is in, that was found because that gene was found, is a pathway that can be treatable and reverse Parkinson's disease. So while we may have a hundred genes that turn out to be relevant in psychiatry, there will be hundreds of labs if we invest in this work, which we have to do, working on these genes, and somebody's going to stumble onto a pathway which turns out to be the most targetable, correctable, and it'll be helpful to everybody, or 70% of the people, if they don't have that gene. So that's, you know, it, you can look at this stuff and just go, it's too complicated, it's overwhelming, where do you start? But when you've come from a field that has never had a beachhead, where everybody's been out in rafts, all looking at a different part of the island, and thinking they know what the island looks like, to say that you would not want to put all your forces on that beachhead, I think it's a no-brainer. Is it, excuse me, um, so is it possible to uh, create a resiliency gene? Well, I mean, I don't think we're going to change people's genes. You know, th th there are certain conditions, obviously, where the gene explains all of the biology of disease, like these immunological disorders that people are actually trying to change, where you want to change a gene because a gene is defective, it's causing only this problem, and if you could correct it, you correct only this problem and not affect anything else that was normally functioning. We don't have that issue in, in our genes because our genes are in, well, everybody in this room has some psychiatric risk genes. We, re, we assume the reason some people express the condition and others don't is because enough of them, by chance or by inheritance, coalesce in certain un, more unfortunate people than others. But everybody has some of them. And then there are environments that make those genes have a much greater impact. 
So we're not going to change people's genes. But there clearly are resiliency factors that are genetic. I just showed you one interesting aspect with BDNF, where in some biological contexts, which have to do with learning and memory, the gene, you know, when we first made this observation, People in my group said, well, of course it makes sense. The reason that people with the metalleal show less of this anxiety-related biology is because they can't remember that they were feeling threatened. So they don't feel as anxious. But that turns out not to be what it is. It's much more fundamentally biological than that. So that gene has an advantage in the development of certain brain functions, but it has disadvantages in other places. And that's probably a lot of what happens evolutionarily because you know, we, only, we don't have that many genes, ironically. There are simple, yeast have many more genes than we do. There are simple puffer fish have many more genes than we do. Because it wasn't that efficient for evolution to keep having to hatch new genes. It was much more efficient to take the existing genes and make little modifications in how you put them together and reassemble them, etc. And that was a much more efficient way to build a complex biology than to have to spin out new genes. So we're going to find ways to maximize the function of systems in the brain that are identified by this genetics. We're not going to change it, but I think we will have insights to what makes a person more resilient at the biological brain level, and we can try to use those insights to develop interventions that will exaggerate the function of those systems while minimizing the fun or correcting or compensating for the functions of the other systems that the genes will identify as being related to an anxiety profile or a psychosis profile or a cognitive functional profile. That's the hope. But, you know, this is not easy. This is a very serious investment in basic science and translational science uh, that will bring in new generations of investigators. One of the great things about genes, which is one of the great things about private investment in mental illness research, and why things like the Staglin Festival and NARSAT and all these major efforts to to raise the consciousness of the, of the public community is so important is because we have to bring investigate. Genes has made, have made it possible. Ava Anton, who was the winner of the, uh, of the uh, Stagland Music Festival Award today, he would never have been in this field. This is, a, this is a very talented developmental molecular neurobiologist who is studying a schizophrenia and bipolar disorder gene. If we had said to him 10 years ago in his, gene, in his career, uh, I think that I'm speaking correctly for you, that we want you to study schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, he would have said, I can't study those. You have no clues to these diseases. I'm going to be, I'm going to be swimming in a backwater of, of science and medicine with no clues. Because neuregulin, which is a gene that he has been one of the you know, major figures in the world in understanding how it relates to brain development, relates to brain development is about schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. We now have somebody working in this field that would never have brought his level of expertise and talent to bear on these problems. We will have generations of scientists who are going to be, because of the support of you people, uh, moving into areas of science that they stayed away from traditionally you know, for, for, for generations of scientists because we didn't have these clues which are so fundamental to understanding these disorders. And because scientists like Ava Anton understand that they can do experiments based on genes. They, genes are tractable commodities at the level of basic science that can be understood. And that translates his work, and I'm already introducing him, involves translating how these genes work into how cells move in a developing brain so that the right circuits get constructed. Because schizophrenia genes and bipolar genes are probably very much about how circuits get constructed and how they stay appropriately constructed. This thing we call plasticity. And these genes are about how those processes take place. And we need people like Ava Anton and developmental neurobiologists and cell biologists to begin to study these disorders at a level of science that no one dreamed about in psychiatry one generation ago. Sam Barrandus was the only cell biologist, maybe one of five, and he was almost driven out of the field, <laughs> you know, as, as a heretic uh, in, for, for a generation of people working in psychiatric research because we didn't have any tools, we didn't have any insights that made the basic science that is the, you know, the mainstream of biomedical research in all other fields of medicine, we didn't have the tools and the insights to make that science relevant. 
We do now. And just as it is, informs us in how cancer is treated and informs us in how uh, epilepsy and, and multiple sclerosis is treated, it will lead to some advances. It has to. Hi, um, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for the delivery of your presentation today. It's really easy for us that are not as uh, academically educated as you. I wanted to ask you something. I established a uh, group here in um, Napa three years ago, and it's a group, a support group for bipolar and depression. So it is somewhat of my ministry to help people uh, to be supported in both family uh, and friends and in both people that are diagnosed. And I'm very happy with the success of that and it's work that is hardly done by anybody. So one thing I wanted to ask you about your presentation, about the environmental effect of these genes. How could I, um, what kind of way could I, not a simplistic, but a delivery to those parents, family, and friends that are so worried about their, you know, uh, their wife, their, their sister, their brother, their grandparent, that they think will never get married or do a job or do whatever again. You know, the fear of that. How, how could I in some way um, assist my support group in, you know, um, uh, neutralizing or some way addressing those fears? I think there's actually some concrete things you could do. You're, you're asking an a important question about what people refer to as genetic counseling. You know, how do you inform people? You know, because all these studies that are illustrating that genes are being found and they relate to these illnesses and they can be understood at a biological level do have implications for families and people trying to understand what do the genes mean to my family. So there's a couple. So counseling these families and helping them understand what genetic research and discoveries mean is very important. There are a couple places you can get actually concrete information. The NIMH has a number of materials that they can make available to you. If you go to the NIMH website, which is just nimh.nih.gov, you can get a lot of material about genetic counseling of psychiatric disorders like depression and bipolar disorder. And they'll give you, and it's worth having this available, give you detailed information of what it means, what is the risk if you have, this is actually an advertisement for um, our studies at, at, at NIH. So uh, you, there, you can um, get actual information that people can use to help them understand what it means if somebody in their family has a psychiatric or mental illness for the risk of other people in the family. The story, of course, is these are common medical disorders. So they exist with very high prevalence as medical disorders, as conditions in the human population. So, you know, every family has something. The odds that anyone in the family will have a major psychiatric Ill illness if somebody else has it in the family are always small. They're always less than one out of 10. So the odds are always small. These are not like, uh, like Huntington's disease or these rare medical disorders where a gene runs in the family, the family is at very high risk. So, but these are, these are not trivial risks, but they're small risks. Um, I think as we, over time, have a better understanding of the architecture of how these genes assemble themselves in families, we might have better information than that. But currently, that's the kind of information that we have. Genes, you know, psychiatric disorders run in families. They run in families not for the reasons that language or religion runs in families. They're not about what you're taught and what you learn. They're about the genes that are passed in families. Uh, and People come together, they marry and they mate, and they bring genes from their ancestors. And people are all, you know, we, come, we have different lines of ancestors, and these trees, you know, keep growing back in our ancestries. And they all coalesce in our individual chromosomes, and you have paternal ancestries and maternal ancestries, and they form a, an offspring. And those genes all com combine, and the vagaries of those combinations determine how at risk somebody is. Um, but the genetics of mental illness is about being at risk and people have different levels of risk based on the genes they inherit. The risk is, you know, the risk is always a, a you know, a small risk. Now those are the facts. I mean, I think what we need to inform consumers about is what, what we know and what we don't know. And hopefully we can help you make the judgment space. And I don't think anything we know 
about the genetics of mental disorders justifies somebody making a decision, an individual decision, about being married or about having children. We don't have that. The information does not justify those kinds of decisions. Yes, I'm just wondering when you mentioned a modification of the genetic um, inheritance of the different bipolar or schizophrenic, is that done via medication in prior generations, or how are you considering modification of the genetic expression? We, we, no, it's a very good question. I want to reiterate this. We, we never expect that we'll change people's genes. I mean, I, I can't see that, you know, I, I, should say, I shouldn't say never, because in medicine you never say never. But it seems exceedingly unlikely that this will ever happen for disorders where the genes are common aspects of human evolution. Um, what we hope to be able to use the gene for, there's three things we would use gene information for. One is to individualize treatment. Because we believe, and this is, begun, this is done in cancer now, and it will be done probably in other areas of medicine, that some of the variation in treatment response is because people have variable genetic factors that affect the biology of how these drugs work on them. So when we can better elaborate the critical genetic complexities and the architecture and in everybody's individual alphabet soup, we will be able to have a better way of predicting who would be more likely to respond to which combinations of drugs. So we think we will be able to optimize individual medicine a little better. Right now we have no tools to do this at all. It's a crapshoot in terms of what people respond to, what they get from who. The second thing we think we'll do is that we will be able to predict outcome better because we'll understand that some people have genes that are associated with a better outcome. Some people have genes associated with a poor outcome. You know, this is not necessarily good or bad news, but part of being good caretakers is to know the facts so you can make the appropriate adaptations. The third thing, and I think the thing that people are most excited about, is that genes are entry points into the pathways of the molecular biology of cells. Genes are one of, I showed you that slide that had all those chemicals inside the cell. That is, the, genes are just one little way station. It's like, you know, it's like these domino games. You know, in the Guinness Book of Records, they have this, like a, a gymnasium at a school where they have the world's biggest domino set. And the kid up there pushes one domino, and every domino over the last 20 minutes in the gymnasium goes down, and then finally one domino there goes away. And that last domino is the mental disorder. The genes represent the first dominoes, and then all these things have this sea of dominoes that are falling and interacting. There are critical nodes in this domino game where if you could stop this critical node, you could stop all the dominoes downstream of that node from falling. The assumption is that there will be critical nodes in these complex cellular pathways that we don't know about because we have to learn from these genes, because the genes tell us what are the criminal do critical dominoes. These critical dominoes, there'll be nodes that we can target. This is, the, this is what we hope for. There will be nodes that can be targeted with drugs or maybe other interventions that will stop the downstream dominoes from flowing. But we don't know which dominoes are critical until we define the pathways based on these genes.